John Zarkowski, The Photographer's Eye Introduction This book is an investigation of what photographs look like and of why they look that way. It is concerned with the photographic style and with photographic tradition, with the sense of possibilities that a photographer today takes to his work. The invention of photography provided a radically new picture-making process, a process based not on synthesis but on selection. The difference was a basic one. Paintings were made, constructed from a storehouse of traditional schemes and skills and attitudes, but photographs, as the man on the street put it, were taken. The difference raised a creative issue of a new order. How could this mechanical and mindless process be made to produce pictures meaningful in human terms, pictures with clarity and coherence and a point of view? It was soon demonstrated that an answer would not be found by those who loved too much the old forms, for in large part the photographer was bereft of the old artistic traditions. Speaking of photography, Baudelaire said, This industry, by invading the territories of art, has become art's most mortal enemy. And in, this own, and his, own, in his own terms of reference, Baudelaire was half right. Certainly, the new medium could not satisfy old standards. The photographer must find new ways to make his meaning clear. These new ways might be found by men who could abandon their allegiance to pr traditional pictorial standards, or by the artistically ignorant, who had no allegiances to break. There have been many of the latter sort. Since its earliest days, photography has been practiced by thousands who shared no common tradition or training, who were disciplined and united by no academy or guild, who considered their medium variously, as a science, an art, a trade, or an entertainment, and who were often aware, unaware of each other's work. Those who invented photography were scientists and painters, but its professional practitioners were a very different lot. Hawthorne's daguerreotypist hero Holgrave in The House of the Seven Gables was perhaps not far from typical. Though not but 22 years old, he had already been a country schoolmaster, salesman in a country store, and the political editor of a country newspaper. He had subsequently traveled as a peddler of cologne water and other essences. He had studied and practiced dentistry. Still more recently, he had been a public lecturer on mesmerism, for which science he had very remarkable endowments. His present phase as a daguerreotypist was of no more importance in his own view, nor likely to be more permanent than any of the preceding ones. The enormous popularity of the new medium produced professionals by the thousands, converted silversmiths, tinkers, druggists, blacksmiths, and printers. If photography was a new artistic problem, such men had the advantage of having nothing to unlearn. Among them, they produced a flood of images. In 1853, the New York Daily Tribune estimated that three million daguerreotypes had been produced that year. Some of these pictures were the product of knowledge and skill and sensibility and invention. Many were the product of accident, improvisation, misunderstanding, and empirical experiment. But whether produced by art or by luck, each picture was part of a massive assault on our traditional habits of seeing. By the latter decades of the 19th century, the professionals and the serious amateurs were joined by an even larger host of casual snapshooters. By the early 80s, the dry plate, which could be purchased ready to use, had replaced the refractory and messy wet plate process, which demanded that the plate be prepared just before exposure and processed before its emulsion had dried. The dry plate spawned the hand camera and the snapshot. Photography had become easy. In 1893, an English writer complained that the new situation had created an army of photographers who run rampant over the globe, pho photographing objects of all sorts, sizes, and shapes under the al almost every condition, without ever pausing to ask themselves, is this or that artistic? They spy a view... It seems to please the camera is focused and the shot taken. There is no pause. Why should there be? For art may err, but nature cannot miss, says the poet, and they listen to the dictum. To them, composition, light, shade, form, and texture are so many catchphrases. These pictures, taken by the thousands, by journeyman worker and Sunday hobbyists, were unlike any pictures before them. The variety of their imagery was prodigious. 
Each subtle variation in viewpoint or light, each passing moment, each change in the tonality of the print created a new picture. The trained artist could draw a head or a hand from a dozen perspectives. The photographer discovered that the gestures of a hand were infinitely various, and that the wall of a building in the sun was never twice the same. Most of this deluge of pictures seemed formless and accidental, but some achieved coherence, even in their strangeness. Some of the new images were memorable and seemed significant beyond their limited intention. These remembered pictures enlarged one's sense of possibilities as he looked again at the real world. While they were remembered, they survived, like organisms, to reproduce and evolve. But it was not only the way that photography described things that was new, it was also the things it chose to describe. Photographers shot objects of all sorts, sizes, and shapes without ever pausing to ask themselves, is this or that artistic? Painting was difficult, expensive, and precious, and it recorded what was known to be important. Photography was easy, cheap, and ubiquitous, and it recorded anything. Shop windows and sod houses, family pets and steam engines, and unimportant people. And once made objective and permanent, immortalized in a picture, these trivial things took on importance. By the end of the century, for the first time in history, even the poor man knew what his ancestors had looked like. The photographer learned in two ways. First, from a worker's intimate understanding of his tools and materials, if his plate would not record the clouds, he could point the camera down and eliminate the sky. And second, he learned from other photographs, which presented themselves in an unending stream. Whether his concern was commercial or artistic, his tradition was formed by all the photographs that had impressed themselves upon his consciousness. The pictures reproduced in this book were made over almost a century and a quarter. They were made for various reasons, by men of different concerns and varying talent. They have, in fact, little in common except their success and a shared vocabulary. These pictures are unmistakably photographs. The vision they share belongs to no school or aesthetic theory, but to photography itself. The character of this vision was discovered by f photographers at work as their awareness of photography's potentials grew. If this is true, it should be possible to consider the history of the medium in terms of photographers' progressive awareness of characteristics and problems that have seemed inherent in the medium. Five such issues are considered below. These issues do not define discrete categories of the work. On the contrary, they should be regarded as interdependent aspects of a single problem, as section views through the body of photographic tradition. As such, it is hoped that they may contribute to the formulation of a vocabulary and a critical perspective more fully responsive to the unique phenomena of photography. The thing itself. The first thing that the photographer learned was that photography dealt with the actual. He had not only to accept this fact, but to treasure it. Unless he did, photography would defeat him. He learned that the world itself is an artist of incomparable inventiveness and that to recognize its best works and moments, to anticipate them, to clarify them, and to make them permanent, requires intelligence both acute and supple. But he learned also that the factuality of his pictures, no matter how convincing and unarguable, was a different thing than the reality itself. Much of the reality was filtered out in the static little black and white image, and some of it was exhibited with an unnatural clarity, in an exaggerated importance. The subject and the picture were not the same thing. Although they would afterwards seem so, it was the photographer's problem to see not simply the reality before him, but the still invisible picture, and to make his choice in terms of the latter. This was the artistic problem, not the scientific one, but the public believed that the photograph could not lie, and it was easier for the photographer if he believed to, or pretended to. Thus, he was likely to claim that what our eyes saw was an illusion, and what the camera saw was the truth. Hawthorne's Hallgrave, speaking of a difficult portrait subject, said, We give heaven's broad and simple sunshine credit only for depicting the merest surface, but it actually brings out the secret character with a truth that no painter could ever venture upon, even could he detect it. The remarkable point is that the original wears to the world's eye 
an exceedingly pleasant countenance indicative of benevolence, openness of heart, sunny good humor, and other praiseworthy qualities of the cast. The sun, as you see, tells quite another story and will not be coaxed out of it after a half a dozen patient attempts on my part. Here we have a man, sly, subtle, hard, imperious, and withal, cold as ice. In a sense, Holgrave was right in giving more credence to the camera image than to his own eyes, for the image would survive the subject and become the remembered reality. William M. Ivins Jr. said, At any given moment, the accepted report of an event is of greater importance than the event. For what we think about and act upon is the symbolic report and not the concrete event itself. He also said, The 19th century began by delivering that what was reasonable was true and would end up by believing that what it saw a photograph of was true. The detail. The photographer was tied to the facts of things, and it was his problem to force the facts to tell the truth. He could not, outside the studio, pose the truth. He could only record it as he found it, and it was found in nature in a fragmented and unexplained form, not as a story but as scattered and suggestive clues. The photographer could not assemble these clues into a coherent narrative. He could only isolate the fragment, document it, and by doing so, claim it for uh, some special significance, a meaning which went beyond simple description, the compelling clarity with which a photograph recorded the trivial suggested that the subject had never before been properly seen, that it was in fact perhaps not trivial, but filled with undiscovered meaning. If photographs could not be read as stories, they could be read as symbols. The decline of narrative painting in the past century has been described in large part to the rise of photography, which relieved the painter of the necessity of storytelling. This is curious, since photography has never been successful at narrative. It has, in fact, seldom attempted it. The elaborate 19th century montages of Robinson and Rejlander, laboriously pieced together from several posed negatives, attempted to tell stories, but these works were recognized in their own time as pretentious failures. In the early days of the picture magazines, the attempt was made to achieve narrative through photographic sequences. But the superficial coherence of these stories was generally achieved at the expense of, the f of photographic discovery. The heroic documentation of the American Civil War by the Brady Group and the incomparably larger photographic record of the Second World War had this in common. Neither explained, without extensive captioning, what was happening. The function of these pictures was not to make the story clear, it was to make it real. The Great War photographer Robert Kappa expressed both the narrative poverty and the symbolic power of photography when he said, if your pictures aren't good, you're not close enough. The frame. Since the photographer's picture was not conceived but selected, his subject was never truly discreet, never wholly self-contained. The edges of his film demarcated what he thought most important, but the subject he had shot was something else. It had extended in four directions. If the photographer's frame surrounded two figures, isolating them from the crowd in which they stood, it created a relationship between these two figures that had not existed before. The central act of photography, the act of choosing and eliminating, forces a concentration on the picture edge, the line that separates uh, in from out and on the shapes that are created by it. During the first half century of photography's lifetime, photographs were printed the same size as the exposed plate. Since enlarging was generally impractical, the photographer could not change his mind in the darkroom and decide to use only a fragment of the picture without reducing its size accordingly. If he had purchased an 8x10 plate, or worse, preparing it, he had carried it as part of his back-bending load and had processed it, he was not likely to settle for a picture half that size. A sense of simple economy was enough to make the photographer try to fill the picture to its edges. The edges of the picture were seldom neat. Parts of the figures of the building or features of landscape were truncated, 
leaving a shape belonging not to the subject, but, if the picture was a good one, to the balance, the propriety of the image. The photographer looked at the world as though it was a scroll painting, unrolled from hand to hand, exhibiting an infinite number of croppings, of compositions, as the frame moved onwards. The sense of the picture's edge as a cropping device is one of the qualities of form that most interested the inventive painters of the latter 19th century. To which degree this awareness came from photography and to what degree from oriental art is still open to study. However, it is possible that the prevalence of the photographic image helped prepare the ground for an appreciation of the Japanese print, and also that the compositional attitudes of these prints owed much to the habits of seeing which stemmed from the scroll tradition. Time. There is, in fact, no such thing as an instantaneous photograph. All photographs are time exposures of shorter or longer, longer duration, and each describes a discrete parcel of time. This time is always the present. Uniquely in the history of pictures, a photograph describes only that period of time in which it was made. Photography alludes to the past and the future only insofar as they exist in the present. The past through its surviving relics, the future through prophecy visible in the present. In the days of slow films and slow lenses, photographs described a time segment of se several seconds or more. If the subject moved, images resulted that had never been seen before. Dogs with two heads and a sheaf of tails, faces without features, transparent men spreading their diluted substance half across the plate. The fact that these pictures were considered, at best, as partial failures, is less interesting than the fact that they were produced in quantity. They were familiar to all photographers and to all customers who had posed with squirming babies for family portraits. It is surprising that the prevalence of these radical images has not been of interest in art historians. The time-lapse painting of Duchamp and Bela, done before the First World War, has been compared to work done by photographers such as Edgerton and Mili, who worked consciously with similar ideas of a, a quarter of a century later. But the accidental time-lapse photographs of the 19th century have been ignored, presumably because they were accidental. As photographic materials were made more sensitive and lenses and shutters faster, photography turned to the exploration of rapidly moving subjects. Just as the eye is incapable of registering the single frames of a motion picture projected on the screen at the rate of 24 frames per second, so is it incapable of following the positions of a rapidly moving subject in life, the galloping horse in the classic example. As lovingly drawn countless thousands of times by Greeks and Egyptians and Persians and Chinese and down through all the battle scenes and sporting prints of Christendom, the horse ran with four feet extended, like a fugitive from a carousel. Not till Moybridge successively photographed a galloping horse in 1878 was the convention broken. It was this way also with the flight of birds, the play of muscles on the athlete's back, the drape of pedestrians' clothing, and the fugitive expressions of a human face. Immobilizing these thin slices of time has been a source of continuing fascination for the photographer. And while pursuing this experiment, he discovered something else. He discovered that there was a pleasure and a beauty in the fragmenting of time that had little to do with what was happening. It had to do, rather, with seeing the momentary patterning of lines and shapes that had been previously concealed within the flux of movement. Cartier-Bresson defined his commitment to this new beauty with the phrase, the decisive moment. But the phrase has been misunderstood. The thing that happens at the decisive moment is not a dramatic climax, but a visual one. The result is not a story, but a picture. Vantage point. Much has been said about the clarity of photography, but little has been said about the obscurity. And yet, it is photography that has taught us to see from the unexpected vantage point and has shown us pictures that give the sense of the scene while withholding its narrative meaning. 
Photographers from necessity chose from the options available to them, and often this means pictures from the other side of the proscenium, showing the actors' back, pictures from the bird's view or the worms, or pictures in which the subject is distorted by extreme foreshortening or by none, or by an unfamiliar pattern of light, or by a seemingly ambiguity of action or gesture. Ivans wrote with rare perception of the effect that such pictures had on the 19th century eyes. At first, the public had talked a great deal about what it called photographic distortion, but it was not long before men began to think photographically and thus to see for themselves things that it had previously taken the photograph to reveal to their astonished and protesting eyes. Just as nature had once imitated art, so now it began to imitate the picture made by the camera. After a century and a quarter, photography's ability to challenge and reject our schematized notions of reality is still fresh. In his monograph on Francis Bacon, Lawrence Alloway speaks of the effect of photography on the painter. The evasive nature of his imagery, which is shocking but obscure, like accident or atrocity photographs, is arrived at by using photography's huge repertory of visual images. Uncaptioned news photographs, for instance, often appear as momentous and extraordinary. Bacon uses this property of photography to subvert the clarity of pose of figures in traditional painting. The influence of photography on modern painters and on modern writers has been great and inestimable. It is strangely easier to forget that photography has also influenced photographers. Not only great pictures by great photographers, but photography, the great undifferentiated homogeneous whole of it, has been teacher, library, and laboratory for those who have consciously used the camera as artists. An artist is a man who seeks new structures in which, in, in which to order and simplify his sense of the reality of life. For artist photographer, much of his sense of reality, where his picture starts, and much of his sense of craft or structure, where his picture is completed, were anonymous and tr untraceable gifts from photography itself. The history of photography has been less a journey than a growth. Its movement has not been linear and consecutive, but centrifugal. Photography and our understanding of it has spread from a center. It has, by infusion, penetrated our consciousness. Like an organism, photography was born whole. It is in our progressive discovery of it that its history lies.